thank you, everybody. Always a pleasure to be here. Uh, usually, I start these things with a trigger warning, uh, but I, I don't actually have one. Uh, there's nothing bad in here. Not really. Uh, people complain that I depress them, so I thought I would try to uh, do something the opposite of depressing. We'll see how that goes. Okay. So I couldn't afford to finish school, and anyway, nobody wanted me for my brains. All they saw was a big, strong man who could lift things, so that's all they would hire me for. For all my dreams, that's what I did with my life, lift things. It wasn't my choice. It was just the destiny that I was born into, and it did not make me happy. At the dawn of the century, I left my native Hawaii and moved to Seattle because I wanted to live in a place that better matched my mood. I wasn't a happy person. I was a very unlucky person. I got a job with Alaska Airlines, lifting things. But after some incidents, two of my friends dying at work, seeing myself aging so fast I couldn't recognize my own reflection, I realized that I needed to make a change or I wasn't going to be around for much longer. When I had first started with the airline, I commented once to someone that they had what seemed to me like an easy job. And they said, yes, and I get paid more too. And I said, how do I get your job? And they said, yeah, it's called skilled labor. Look into it. And I thought, what a dick. <laughs> but after five years of backbreaking labor on my knees in the belly of an aircraft, I thought, well, maybe he's right. So I taught myself to code, and together with a colleague, we built an online training system that saved the airline so much money that they had no choice but to see me as someone capable of doing more than simply lifting things. And just like that, I traded my blue collar for a white collar, and the rest is history. Well, except that usually when I tell the story, if I tell the story, I talk about what happened next leaving the company, going to my first dub dub, being humiliated by seeing the difference between programming and software engineering, meeting my mentor, Will Shipley, and eventually giving up everything I owned to serve a three-year apprenticeship in software engineering. But that's not actually the whole story. There's actually this whole other thread, this whole other thing that happened, which I've never actually talked about before, even though it might actually be the more important thing, the more life-changing thing, and that is this. I changed my luck. I went from being an unlucky person to a lucky person. You see, this colleague of mine, he was the opposite of me. He was charming and talented and happy. He seemed like the luckiest person I'd ever met, and I was so jealous of him. Then I came across this article that said that it was possible to change your luck and how, and so with the article and by studying my colleague, I began to make changes, and they really worked. And it was that changing luck that allowed for everything that followed and that has, as much as anything, made me into the happy, lucky, and dare I say, charming and talented person that I am today. So that's what I'd like to talk about, changing your luck, how to change your mood, how to stay excited in a world that's falling apart. So in the Japanese culture in which I grew up, some years of life are considered yakudoshi, or calamitous years. For men, the worst year of your life is said to be the age of 42. And this is because in Japanese, the numbers four and two can be pronounced shi ni, which sounds like to death. It's just a superstition, of course, but in my case, it actually turned out to be pretty much absolutely correct. My 42nd birthday was right before the last 360, so basically as soon as I came home from the conference, my life pretty well started falling apart. I had my heart broken. This new relationship I'd been so excited about turned terrible and toxic. I broke my foot. And then I had to write my first eulogy for one of my best friends who died. And the list goes on. And yet, I can honestly say, I've never been happier in my life. Not because my life has gotten easier, but because my philosophy has gotten better. 
And there's a name for this. In Latin, we say amor fati, to love your fate, to realize that you cannot change what the world is going to throw at you, but you can change how you see it and how you deal with it. Sometimes it's going to seem good. Sometimes it's going to seem bad. Sometimes it's going to get hard. But what it comes down to is this. The more opportunity you can find, the more successful you're going to be, and the better you're going to become at dealing with what life throws at you. You're going to be able to make the best use of the good that comes to you. But you're also going to be able to make the best use of the bad that comes to you. And what's going to eventually happen is you're going to become happier and more successful, and that's going to change the kind of energy you're putting out there, and that in turn is going to cause others around you to react differently and more favorably to you, which is in turn is going to increase and improve the numbers and types of opportunities that present themselves to you. In other words, whether you're suffering or whether you're ecstatic, as long as you're always getting better, then your overall experience will always get better. The ups and downs are always going to be there, but the trend will be ever upward. It really is all about how you look at things. Let me give you some examples from my recent experiences. So after breaking my foot and needing surgery, I had to spend some time in a wheelchair, which meant that I got to experience what it's like to be pushed around in a wheelchair, taking transit in a wheelchair, being that person who's driven around in a little cart through the airport. At one point, trying to cross the street, I got dumped out of the chair, and I'm laying in the middle of the street, and I'm thinking to myself, what a blessing. I mean, don't get me wrong, I was also thinking, fuck! <laughs> but I was also thinking, what a blessing. Because the thing is, I worked in transportation for years. At Alaska Airlines, we were trained in this, recurrent training every year, because we had to help people. We had to load and unload their wheelchairs. And honestly, wheelchairs are some of the most challenging cargo to deal with. And so they really tried to impress upon us that as hard as it is for us to transport a wheelchair, it's nothing compared to how hard it is to travel in this manner. And so I thought that I had a pretty decent understanding of what that was like, but actually, no. Being dumped on the street, being constantly humiliated, feeling so self-conscious and, and scared. To be honest, it's terrifying being pushed in a wheelchair. It really gave me this mental picture that I, I can feel even now in my whole body. Whereas before, I had only a, a caricature. And that is such a blessing. Whereas before, I'm like, oh, yeah, 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 I know. Now I actually do. And that sort of enlightenment is really just the most beautiful thing. To go from such abject ignorance to such beautiful enlightenment, even through something so unpleasant, is just, wow. I wouldn't wish it upon myself, but having gotten there, what a blessing. I find that when I intersect my initial negative thoughts and sort of intentionally insert new positive thoughts, not only does it make me feel better in that moment, but when I look back on my life, I can tell you, like, this year has been hard, but it's gotten me to where I am. And even though maybe the weather today is not very nice, where I am today is still pretty darn great. Because I feel like my worst day now is better than past me's greatest fantasies. And I can say that because when I look at my life, I can say there's the destiny I was born to, there are my wildest dreams, and there's where I am now. It reminds me of the time when I climbed the Great Wall of China, which they really should call the Great Staircase of China because that's what it actually is. The great unevenly spaced, hard to climb, Staircase of China. And I had no idea until I'm like standing at the foot of this mountain and realizing that this day is going to be very different than I thought it was going to be. I wasn't expecting any kind of a workout, but what am I going to do? Turn around and go home? So I just looked up the mountain as far as I could see, and, and, and I saw way up there, there was this pagoda, and I said to myself, all I can do is set a goal, say, 
that pagoda up there and just put one foot in front of the other and just see what I can do, see how close I can get. And so I did. Now when you're climbing up the Great Wall, there's this line of people and you're all climbing through this terrible smog. And every so often you reach this guard tower where you have a chance to get out of line, take a rest, maybe take in the view. But you don't want to linger too long because it stinks like piss because people piss there. So I'd sort of make it to one tower and make it to the next tower. And as I get tired and tired, each tower becomes harder and harder to get to. Each one was like this miniature struggle between me and the tower, me and the tower. And I would think, this is going to be my last tower. But after a rest, I'd get a second wind and I'd say, no, nah, I think I can make it to the next tower. So I kept doing this and I kept doing this until at one point I had this experience and I don't want to say the wrong thing, but I had this experience of having a heart attack. It was like a great hand had just grabbed me by the chest and just squeezed me so hard I couldn't breathe and just sat me down. I just stopped. And I thought to myself, oh God, here it is. This is it. I'll be dead before I get off this wall. And all I could do was just sit there and just wait to stop existing. And then I just sort of kept existing. And eventually my chest loosened up and I could breathe again. But I knew, no, nah, that's it, I'm done. I, I can't go anymore. That's it for me and the I have to go. And I felt, I mean, I was tired. So I couldn't feel too bad about it. But I just, I just looked at so much wall still to go, stretching out before me and I just, I felt pretty disappointed. So I shakily kind of got up and crossed to the other side and started walking back down. And then I saw way down there was that pagoda. That pagoda that had been my goal, but which I hadn't even thought about and that I had passed long ago. Because the thing is the wall, it, it just keeps going and going. So I thought that I hadn't gone very far, but actually I had gone farther than I had ever thought possible. So I think the lesson I learned on that wall is that it's important both to continue looking forward to the next goal and the next goal, but that also sometimes we have to look back and realize how far we've come. For example, I do this meetup every week as part of Amsterdam called Amsterdam Business Chat. And what it really is is that when we first started Amsterdam, we asked people what was holding them back, and so many people said a lack of venture capital that we actually established a seed fund, the Amsterdam Fund, and spent a year interviewing candidates. But we couldn't find anything worth funding, and I realized that the problem was not a lack of funding, the problem was that people were just thinking about business the wrong way. And so we put away the funding, the denial of which was just a negative experience for everyone, but I kept meeting with people to hear their ideas and straighten their heads out about how business actually works. So this meetup is sort of my ongoing attempt to give two hours a week back to the community. And to be honest, sometimes nobody shows up. And sometimes there's two. There's probably an average of about one person a week, 50 weeks a year. And it's really easy to feel disheartened and disappointed. If I were to say something to myself like, man, sometimes nobody even comes, or there's just one person. Like this thing is barely holding on. But actually, when I look back on it, I think, I've had these kind of intense, one-on-one, -on -one, life-changing conversations with like 50 people a year for years. That's like hundreds of people. That's actually pretty impressive. So it's nice to look back. You know, it's important to see what we've done. Up to a point, of course. Like, you can't get obsessed with it. You can't just stop where you are and spend the rest of your life telling the story about how you passed the pagoda. But we really do need to occasionally look back and realize where we actually have made progress, where we actually have changed people's lives. And it's really cool and we should feel amazing about ourselves because we're amazing people. And we shouldn't feel bad about feeling amazing because that's not gonna help anybody. We did the good that we did by being amazing, by feeling amazing. And we got to be amazing mostly by failing and being humiliated. And rather than letting that destroy us or stop us, we endeavored to double down. Or maybe we quit and we found something else that we were good at, but then we really poured ourselves into it. We developed a good work ethic and we really worked at it. 
Because in the end, it's always better to have tried something and even just fail at it and gain the respect for how hard it actually is to do than to live a life of regret and resentment at all the things that it seemed like everybody else got to do that didn't even seem that difficult, but you just never got to do that because you're not lucky. Seriously. I meet so many people who have this kind of dream constipation and it makes them miserable because they're not living their lives, because they think that their real lives are in the future, on the other side of this dream. I think the, in, if that's going to be the way it is, you're better off just not having a dream. I really believe we're better off trying to achieve our dreams because even if we fail, we will gain a new respect for how difficult it really is. Like a couple of years ago, I got it in my head that I wanted to make YouTube videos, because I already do presentations and I had a bunch of content and I knew a lot of really smart, excellent, talented, successful people who were willing to help and it was just like, yeah, all I gotta do is do it. Then I spent months and months and God, it was just so much harder than I thought it was gonna be and I just, I couldn't make something I was proud of. And so now when I hear that oh, some kid made millions of dollars on YouTube, I don't get jealous. I don't think, oh, some people have all the luck. I think, good for them. People think it's so easy. It's not. In the business chat, I see that people are often afraid to pursue their dreams because they're so afraid of failure. But failure, it's not actually that painful, especially when you do it a lot. And if that sounds ridiculous, it's not. Everybody in here knows this. Everybody in here does this. And I know because I'm assuming that you all, like me, are a successful programmer. And I truly believe that being a successful programmer requires one thing above all others. One thing without which you absolutely will not succeed as a programmer. It goes like this, we have all been there. It's not working. It should be working, but it's not. I don't know why. I'm banging my head against the wall. I'm questioning my choice of career. The imposter syndrome begins to envelop and I'm suffocating. And then I fix it. And inevitably, it's something stupid, like some misplaced punctuation or something. And in that moment, we have one of two reactions. We think, oh, God, that was terrible. God, I hate this so much. Or we think, oh, my God, it's working. God, that's so cool. Let's break it again. <laughs> if you're the first type of person, then I'm, I'm sorry. <clears throat> but you really are better off finding something else to do. Seriously, you will be miserable with this. But if you're the second type of person, eh, you might have a chance. The thing is, life is exactly the same way. If you can learn to see failure as part of the path to success, you will fail a lot, but you'll also succeed a lot. If you see failure as devastating, then you're not going to be around long enough to find success. And even if you do, it's not going to feel worth it. Here, I think courage is a muscle. Eventually, you will stop fearing the laughter even when they're laughing at you. I'll tell you a story about how I broke my foot. So, like I said, it's been a hard year. And uh, finally one day, it's Good Friday, the sun is out, finally I can get my skates on and you know, go skate around and remember how to do all these things that I've been learning how to do. And That's not how I broke my foot. Skating is perfectly safe because I, I have so much protective gear on. It's when the protective gear comes off that's the problem. Uh, I was so happy. I was like literally dancing through the streets. And at some point, something was in my way, so I just jumped on top of it and I struck a pose like the beautiful human being that I am. And then I jumped off of it and I broke my foot like the clumsy human being like I am. Uh, so then I had to go to the emergency room and explain this to them, and uh, they all thought it was pretty funny. Uh, at one point, a nurse actually came in and said, I understand that you're a lousy dancer. <laughs> Uh, I said, well, I guess, I, I guess so. Uh, what do you need? Oh, nothing. Um, you, you could have called me Patch Adams for how much joy I brought to the emergency room that day. I think that the other thing that kind of holds people back from trying to achieve their dreams is that their ideas are just, they're too big. And, you know, here too, we see this in the world at large. Because when we think about something like the political climate, or the actual climate, or guns, or schools, or the intersection of guns and schools. The problems of the world, they just seem so 
large as to be insurmountable. Here, I like to remind myself that when things like that need to get done, but don't get done, it's because somebody is profiting from holding things back. And that they don't care if we don't believe it's happening, or if we don't think anything can be done, or if we think somebody else should do it, or if we spend all of our time arguing about it. They don't care as long as we don't do anything. And I like to remember that because there's something in me that makes me say, hell that, let's do something about it. So how do we do something about it? Well, I think however big the problem and however numerous the solutions, the first step is always, always breaking it down into the smallest possible first step. It's one thing to say you want to climb the Great Wall of China. It's another thing to say you want to get up to that pagoda. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to put one foot in front of the other, take one step after the next, and just go from guardhouse to guardhouse. We do this in engineering all the time. We call it functional decomposition. It's how we make the insurmountable surmountable. But another mistake that we make all the time is thinking that these large, complex systems will have simple all or nothing outcomes when that's just not the case. Climate change, for example, is not binary. It's not zero or one. It's the infinite range of numbers between zero and one. The fact is, the better we do, the less bad it will be, and the worse we do, or the less we do, the more bad it will be. It might get so bad that it's the end of us, or it might be that we all get together and work on this thing together and it's not going to be that bad. So probably somewhere between those two extremes is where we'll end up landing, and honestly, every little bit helps. But on the other hand, I was also thinking about this. I always turn the light off when I leave the office, but it doesn't really matter if I do this. I don't have to pay for the electricity, and I don't really think it makes a difference. Like, I really don't think it makes a difference in terms of my consumption. And even if we can say, well, if you don't turn off the light, and nobody else turns off the light, then energy consumption goes up. I mean, sure, that's true, but easing consumption is not going to fix the problem. It's like if I tell you that I, I've reduced the number of people I punch in the face every day. It's nice that I did that. But it's not really solving the problem, it's just sort of slowing it down. I see climate change as being like we're all in this airplane that's losing altitude and most of us are just arguing about it or sitting around saying there's nothing we can do about it. But meanwhile, the plane just continues to descend. And so I just feel like we should just stop arguing and just do something. Because if we can do enough in time, we might still lose altitude, but we can fix the problem before we crash. One of the best things that I ever heard, like really gave me some hope about fighting climate change was this. If you go out into the country and you try to convince a farmer about climate change, there's a very good chance that you're not going to get anywhere. But if you start talking about getting off the grid and getting away from the government, oh, they'll put up solar cells. So maybe we should stop trying to win arguments and just start focusing on results, because otherwise we're gonna burn ourselves out. What is important is that we are effective that we make change that will actually make a difference. Turning off the light is like thoughts and prayers. It's really just a reminder to ourselves that energy is not free, light is not infinite, and that together we are burning our collective candle. It is not the ceremony of turning off the lights. It is not the thoughts and prayers. It's what that focus drives us to do. Well, how do we ensure that we're effective? For starters, I think we have to understand where our power in the world actually lies. Which brings me back to the business chat. Do you know what the most common misconception about business is? People think that you can just have an idea and then just sort of build it and put it in the marketplace, and then if it's a good idea, then you're gonna make money. But that's absolutely not how business works. Uh, that's how school works. That's like what it's like inside a corporate structure where all you really have to do is be creative but when you're actually dealing directly with the market, it's not a good way to make money. It's a good way to break the bank and break your own heart at the same time. Kind of relatedly, I think that the biggest mistake people make about software is thinking that somehow software replaces the need to actually build a business. They think, oh, sure, step one, problem, step two, software, and step three, profit. <laughs> but that is not how software works. That's how business works. Step one, problem, step two, business, step three, profit. What software actually does is it makes the business part more efficient by accelerating its workflows. That's why the most powerful piece of software in the world is probably Excel. 
because it's not really the software that matters, it's the people using the software to do their jobs more efficiently that matter. The metaphor that I like to use is the metaphor of a cell, like a biological cell. Right? You know what a cell is, it's a big bag of chemicals and they just sort of react and do their thing and then you have the DNA and the DNA encodes for proteins and the proteins fold into enzymes and the enzymes catalyze the reaction so that this reaction happens faster or that reaction happens faster and depending on which reactions happen faster, the cell is a blood cell or a nerve cell or a bone cell or whatever. We are like those enzymes. We are the power in the cell that is our system that is able to accelerate this or accelerate that. And through this sort of indirect action, that's where our real power lies. That's where we really have influence. So to tie this all together, we don't fix the problem by having some idea for an app. We fix the problem by finding the people who are fixing the problem and then helping them fix the problem more efficiently. Mr. Rogers said that the best way to deal with a giant tragedy is to look for the helpers that we can take comfort in knowing that there are always people helping. But we as engineers can do better than that. We can help the helpers. Or we can also let our fear of economic uncertainty drive us to instead help the other ones who are causing the problem in the first place. Either way, that is our decision. And that decision is our power. So at the beginning of this talk, I said that the key to staying excited when the world is falling apart is to look for the opportunities, even in the bad. Then I gave several examples, which I would like to sort of summarize for you now. I think the biggest and most obvious opportunity in suffering is to empathize with others whose suffering we could not otherwise understand. The way that having limited mobility taught me what it was really like to have limited mobility. It's also a good way to keep our own pain in perspective to know that whatever we're going through, we are not alone. And indeed, there are those who are suffering in the same way, but worse. It's like at the end of the book of Job, when the neighbor says, yeah, that's pretty bad, but let me tell you what happened to me. In the same vein, we're able to see how the world actually works. If you were to ask me what the transportation infrastructure of Amsterdam was like for people with limited mobility, I probably would have said, well, oh, probably pretty good. And I would have been wrong. And the bad times don't just show us weaknesses in the infrastructure, but also in ourselves. It's never fun to be shown your shortcomings, but it is necessary to be able to fix them, which is how we get better. Success, unfortunately, is a lousy teacher. So thank goodness for failure. Now all of this will enable us to do better the next time. It doesn't do us any good to fret over the past because we can't change the past, but we can change the future. And not just for ourselves, but for others by sharing our experiences. Similarly, it doesn't really do a lot of good to stress over bad things in the future because the domain of possible outcomes is artificially large. It's better to focus on being better yourself so that you can deal with future problems as they come. And of course, sometimes all we can really do in the face of the bad is to laugh at ourselves and the absurdity of life. It's important to be able to laugh at yourself and to laugh with others even when they are laughing at you. At least you're making them laugh. Stand-up comedians would be jealous. And finally, I would point out that the bonds of friendship are not forged in the good times so much as the bad. My therapist is always trying to convince me that I don't need to be worrying so much because if something goes wrong, my friends will have my back. And I want to believe that, but it's really hard to feel that without experiencing it. And so I have to say that breaking my foot really showed me that my therapist was right. On the other hand, it also showed me that some of my friends were not good friends. And that hurt. But it's also a huge blessing because I think it's better to know the truth. We can change our luck. And here are some of the ways. Yes, we can adopt an attitude of not reacting to the good or bad, but of finding the opportunities in the good or bad. We can recognize that life is like the ocean. The waves will come. The water goes up and down. We can either learn to surf or we can drown. The ocean doesn't care. We have to remember to stop and take a break once in a while, not just to catch our breath, but to look back on what we've accomplished and to remind ourselves how great we really are. We have to not let ourselves become obsessed with what is not, but rather focus on what is. The glass is not half full or half empty. 
the glass is simply twice as large as the volume of liquid. Moreover, we have a glass, a clean glass and liquid to quench our thirst. And the glass was never empty anyway, it's full of air, which we also need. <laughs> we might as well be optimists because if the pessimists are right, we're screwed anyway. We must not let our dreams defer, lest they swell and explode like a raisin in the sun. We must at least try. We must not fear failure or let it destroy us, but rather see failure as part of the road to success. And just as we can see failure as part of the road to success, we can see bad as part of the road to good. Because failure and success, good and bad, creation and destruction, these are parts of a whole. And we must not lose sight of the whole because we are too focused on this or that part. In order to find long-term satisfaction in our efforts, they must be effective. And in order for our efforts to be effective, we must understand what we can do and what we cannot do. We have the power, but we must understand where the power lies. So as is traditional in my 360 talks, I like to recommend some media that I've been into. I have a few books that I've really been thinking about a lot this year and a new podcast that I'm super into, which have all been sort of extremely helpful and formative to me, and so I recommend them very heartily. The first is The Parable of the Sower by Octavia E. Butler. It's a, not a pleasant book to read, but I can honestly say that if I had not read this book when I did, I probably wouldn't be here today. Uh, because a few years ago when I was just so filled with despair about the world and the state of technology and I wanted to give up and drop out and go do something else with my life, reading the parable of the sower taught me that we cannot stop change, but we can shape it. But only if we keep on keeping on, because otherwise somebody else shapes it for us. In other words, the worst action is inaction. The next one is called The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron. It's basically a curriculum of exercises that help you become more creative, which doesn't sound like it should be possible, but it actually is, and it's grounded in some pretty strong neuroscience. For example, one exercise I really enjoy is to write three pages every morning. It doesn't matter what, you can just throw them away afterwards. The point is just to make your left brain, which is fast because it's very focused, just kind of take it out and run it around the block and wear it out a little bit so that the other side of the brain, which is more holistic but slower, can have a chance to chime in. Another exercise is to just spend time alone with art, surrounding yourselves with other people's creative output to refill your well and help you inspire your own creativity, which is a phenomenon that is well understood. And the last book is A Return to Love by Marianne Williamson. I learned two things from this book that are very important lessons for me. The first one is about relationships, and the next thing was about self-esteem. We tend to think that when a relationship ends, it has failed. But really, the purpose of a relationship is to get you from one place to another. So if it does that, then it was successful, even though it doesn't last forever, because none of them do. Literally, none of our relationships will last forever. The other thing I learned is that you do not serve the world by hiding your light and ignoring your talents. Even though the world may seek to punish you for shining too brightly, somebody somewhere is being inspired by seeing you standing tall, being proud, and using what you were given to the best of your abilities. Yes, we need to be humble, because we need to be aware, we need to be present, because if we stop paying attention, we're gonna, we're gonna fall. But we have to be honest about the value that we have, and the fact is, the value that we have is quite high. This last year, when things were so difficult, I would think back on some of the people over the years who've talked to me or written me letters about the impact that I've had on their lives. Just to remind myself, in my lowest moments, who I actually am, what I'm actually capable of. But the flip side of that is that if someone has inspired you or helped you, let them know. Because when you can't do anything else, you still have that superpower. The podcast I'm so crazy about is called The Anthropocene Reviewed. The premise is that the host is like reviewing on a five-star scale notable aspects of human activity. But the reality is that somehow hearing the soothing Alan Alda-esque voice of John Green talking about his struggles and his anxieties, somehow it makes my own struggles and anxieties seem okay. Since I have a little bit of time left, I'm gonna tell you a story, not a personal story, but a fable. Something I heard years ago that kind of stayed with me and just kind of felt appropriate to share. 
You know how in English we have all these expressions that don't really make any sense, but they're just references to stories, like when you say sour grapes, what does sour grapes mean? It's a reference to an Aesop's fable, or you say the Good Samaritan, it's like a reference to a biblical story. This is a proverb from China, and it goes like this. Tai Wang Shu Ma. Excuse my Mandarin. Which means a curse that is actually a blessing, or vice versa. It's kind of like the English expression, this too shall pass. It makes reference to a fable of an old man who lives on the border and raises horses for a living. One day, his most prized horse runs away, and his neighbor, hearing of his bad fortune, comes over to offer condolences. But the old man says, eh, who is to say what is good or bad? And indeed, the horse soon returned, leading a whole flock of horses. And so the neighbor came over to congratulate the neighbor on his good fortune. But the old man said, eh, who is to say what's good or bad? And indeed, before long, one of these new horses threw off the old man's son, breaking his leg. Again, the neighbor came over to offer condolences. And again, the old man says, eh, who is to say what's good or bad? And indeed, soon the emperor's army comes marching through, conscripting every able-bodied young man. But the old man's son, being injured, is spared an almost certain death. But eh, who is to say what's good or bad? So with that said, what's the best thing about the world ending? Because make no mistake, the world is ending. And I'm not even talking about climate change or late capitalism or anything specific. We don't need that. Because the reality is we're all here for such a short time and even if you stick around, the world will just move on without you. And so I ask again, what is the best thing about the world ending? To me, it's this. It strips away the bullshit. When you know your days are numbered, you're not going to waste time on people and things that don't matter. And as the end draws near, less and less matters. Maybe at the end, you realize that nothing does. Or maybe, as Aldous Huxley said, you realize that only love matters. Either way, as I once did, if we wait to stop existing, but somehow keep existing, then maybe we'll find the middle way, caring just the right amount. Because it's not that nobody's opinion matters, it's not that everybody's opinion matters, it's that different people's opinions matter different amounts, and that the more we get that right, the better off we're going to be. For me, it's been learning that actually my opinion matters. If I get the idea in my head to wear Hawaiian shirts with Italian suits and then work with a florist to tie the ensemble together with a fantastic boutonniere, it doesn't matter what other people think about that because the only person I really need to surprise and delight is me. And that for me has been the best gift of this year, getting over the hangups and finally having the confidence and the freedom to do the things I want to do. But we're all different. Maybe you see that as frivolous because you worry about different things and that's fine. Whatever you have been afraid of, now is the time to address that. Now is the time to take that class or take that trip or make that call or write that letter. Channel your anxiety into doing something to address that anxiety, to prepare you, to make you better. If you live in the woods, don't just fear the fire or fatalistically believe that there's nothing you can do because you can fireproof your home. Both literally and figuratively, you can fireproof your home. So do it now while you can while stores are still open, while money still has value, while we can still travel freely, while your kids are still talking to you, while your parents are still alive, while there's still time, while you still have energy or youth or good looks or whatever you have left, because this is as good as it's ever going to get and it's never going to be this good again. The last thing I wanted to say, just as a sort of matter of housekeeping, on account of these beautiful boutonnieres. I'm gonna be wearing a different one tonight, so this one and the two from yesterday are basically extra. If you'd like one to wear to the party tonight, it just seems like a shame not to share them. You can just pin it to your shirt, it fixes with magnets. Just let me know. All right, see you tonight. Thank you.